Military observers in London said today that a general Russian offensive coordinated with the Anglo-American attack from the West may be launched within the next 48 hours and almost certainly will begin before the weekend. News of the Allied landing in France spread swiftly throughout Russia today and touched off enthusiastic demonstrations such as rarely have been seen since the war began. American war correspondents in Moscow were the first to break the news, and they were quickly surrounded by cheering crowds who rushed to shake their hands and to offer congratulations. Radio Moscow's chief announcer, who customarily reads only Premier Stalin's orders of the day, broadcasted General Dwight D. Eisenhower's special communique announcing the landing. He read the bulletin in a solemn and triumphant tone, rivaling his best performance for the Red Army's biggest victory announcement. Soviet war marches, Yankee Doodle, and the triumphal music reserved for Stalin's victory orders followed the bulletin. For two weeks now, the Russian people have been expecting the invasion to begin at any moment. And the question on everyone's lips was, has it started? The Soviet people now are waiting for their own armies to strike from the east in the coordinated offensive mapped out at the Tehran Conference. The Germans' Transocean News Agency said today that a battle was in progress in the English Channel north of La Havre between German naval units and Allied forces attempting to make a landing. It is 5 p.m. on D-Day, and there you have it. The die is cast in the Soviet Union, and the second part of the gigantic pincer movement to defeat Nazism is set to begin very soon. In Western Europe, uh, General de Gaulle, leader of the Free French, addresses the French people by radio. In the English-speaking world, the speech is broadcast with simultaneous translation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're informed that we can hear from General de Gaulle in London. So we switch you now to London for the address by General de Gaulle. Pour nos armées de terre, de mer, de l'air, il n'y a point là de problème. Jamais elles ne furent plus ardentes, plus habiles, plus disciplinées. L'Afrique, l'Italie, l'océan et le ciel ont vu leur force et leur gloire renaissantes. La terre natale les verra demain pour la nation qui se bat. General de Gaulle says that never have France's forces of the air, sea, and land had such a glorious opportunity to distinguish themselves. And he speaks of the glories which the French armies have just uh, achieved in the Italian campaign. La seconde est que l'action menée par nous sur les arrières de l'ennemi soit conjuguée aussi étroitement que possible avec celle que mènent de France les armées alliées... General de Gaulle says that the first order which, he has to, which the French government has to give to the French forces uh, will be followed exactly que l'action des forces de la résistance doit durer pour aller sans plissant jusqu'au moment de la déroute allemande. La troisième condition est que tous ceux qui sont capables d'agir, soit par les armes, soit par les destructions, soit par le renseignement, General de Gaulle says that the action which the French armies will carry out with the, the Allies against the enemy will be exactly conjugated with those of the Allies. Ou à la déportation, quelles que soient les difficultés, tout vaut mieux. And with these actions, that of French resistance will also be combined. La bataille de France a commencé. Il n'y a plus dans la nation, dans l'Empire, Dans les armées, qu'une seule et même volonté, qu'une seule et même espérance derrière le nuage. And General de Gaulle says it is absolutely necessary that all French patriots capable to act by arms and by refusing to work for the Germans should not allow themselves to be taken prisoner. Le français qui vous est parvenu de Londres. Nous vous retournons au studio de la Voix de l'Amérique. À New York. And General de Gaulle said in concluding that the Battle of France has begun and there is no longer 
except a single and and uh, sole will to conquer on the part of the French nation. You have just heard a speech by General Charles de Gaulle and its translation, a running translation of that speech by Beverly Thurman of Columbia's shortwave news staff. Now, that speech launches a patriotic frenzy in France. Colonel Zeller, a leader of the OERA, will note in August. The FFE, based on the directives given by General Koenig, launched full throttle into actions without restriction, impelled by a magnificent national uprising of the entire population in the rural areas and small towns. But in the minds of most of the participants, those actions were supposed to be short-lived, and the hope of an imminent landing in the southeast gladdened every heart. The FFE numbered 50,000 in January and has only grown marginally. By the end of June, they will field 100,000 men and women, and by liberation, their numbers will be 500,000. The unfortunate consequence today is that many resistance fighters think that invasion and liberation are the same thing. Rundstedt is already releasing Wehrmacht units to go down and fight the Maquis at Vercors that Sparty talked about earlier today. While the Allies might very well welcome the distraction of some German forces, it will inevitably lead to lots of suffering and many, many deaths. And although it stands in stark contrast to the willingness of the Allies to bomb France and French civilians in preparation for today, this tragedy is exactly what the Allied leaders wanted to avoid when they negated the resistance of place in today's operations. The preferred solution would be that resistance men are integrated into the fighting forces as the regions they are in. Are liberated. But it is not only in France that the invasion is awaited by many. Great Britain, where US troops have been amassing for over a year, has caught invasion fever. To look at that, we turn to Anna. Since at least the Allied landings in Italy in September of 1943, newspapers have been reporting on every piece of information they can find about a cross-channel invasion and a new front in Western Europe. Gossip begins flying at the end of that year about who will be its commander. Once the news breaks that it is Eisenhower, a new round of forecasting comes in on his plan. Military correspondents speculate on Hitler's expectation and his preparations to fight an invasion. There are reports that the BBC has been training staff in special equipment that allows them to report from the front line. When the invasion comes, the people will have front row seats. Of course, real news is difficult to come by. Aside from formal announcement and morale-boosting speeches, Allied leaders are staying very tight-lipped about their plans. Secrecy is everything. Even essential workers are kept in the dark. The ones making parts for Mulberry Harbors don't even know what they are building, although some can likely guess. So life goes on. But Britain's war economy is full steam ahead, and it is impossible not to notice the military buildup. One of the most obvious indicators that something big is happening, exciting to some and, well, annoying to others, is the presence of American troops. On the eve of the invasion, over 1.5 million Americans are stationed in the United Kingdom. They aren't spread out in every corner of the country, but instead concentrated in specific areas. These are the west of England, East Anglia in the east of England, and the corridor in the northeast. The county of Suffolk has an estimated one GI for every six English civilians, and in Wiltshire there is maybe one Yang for every two Brits. British national attention is very much fixed on these little islands of America. Famed military historian Captain Liddell Hart offers his thoughts on his regular column for the Daily Mail. I have recently spent some time in occupied England. During it, I have seen cases of rude and inconsiderate behavior by American soldiers. I have not heard merely grumbling but spiteful criticism from English people. Yet, speaking as an historian, I cannot think of any case in history where relations have been so good. Still less can I recall any case where two great allied armies have got on so well together. But that might not mean much for those sacrificing their home and lands for the new arrivals. 
The government has taken a vast amount of land for the war effort. By now, 20% of the country's land areas is under some form of military control. Much of this is used for training American troops. The government does aim for a policy of dual usage between military and civilian interest. But this hardly leaves agricultural land untouched. One woman will remember how this affected her small farm in Berkshire. Unfortunately, they seldom warned me that they were coming, so sometimes we were at work, plowing, drilling, threshing and so on in their area, and had to abandon work and beat a hasty retreat to avoid the bullets and shells, all of which was very annoying and disorganizing. I don't know how many of their people got shot. It was a miracle they never shot any of us. I once saw them using a flamethrower, a ghastly weapon, and they completely burned up a little spinny with it. Some communities don't have to worry about interacting with Americans, but that's only because they've been forced to leave their homes. This has happened to those living inside an area of Devon that Americans want for training purposes. On November 12th and 13th, after weeks of rumors, approximately 3,000 residents around Slapton Sands are told they must leave their homes by December 20th. The satisfaction and sadness at the news is widespread. Many older residents have never left the area before, and the U.S. Consul reports rumors of suicides at the announcement, but everyone follows the order. The Bishop of Exeter writes a notice addressed to the new American inhabitants that is pinned up on every evacuated church. This church has stood for several hundred years. Around it has grown a community which has lived in these houses and tilled these fields ever since there was a church. This church... This churchyard, in which their loved ones lie at rest, these homes, these fields, are as dear to those who have left them as they are the homes and graves which you, our allies, have left behind you. They hope to return one day, as you hope to return to yours, to find them waiting to welcome them home. But not every interaction between Yank and Brit is a negative one. Many women are particularly excited about the new arrivals. In a world of blackouts and rationing, well-dressed and well-paid Americans add a touch of glamour. As one Roman will remember, we were captivated at once. With their smooth, beautifully tailored uniforms, one could hardly tell a private from a colonel. They swaggered, they boasted and they threw their money around. Even some of the Tommies admit that the Americans are taller, more handsome and overall more impressive than they are. It doesn't help that British pay is much less and their uniforms are thick and shapeless. But there's also, unsurprisingly, a lot of resentment. It's something journalists and commentators have picked up on, accusing the Americans of bringing sexual immorality with them. Of course, the real problem is that the English boys are not receiving the attention they think they should get. If they were, cries about morals probably wouldn't be so strong. But another clash is the racial segregation of the US military. There are around 130,000 black American troops stationed in the United Kingdom. Just like back home, they are segregated into their own units. Segregation is maintained off base as well. There are systems of rotating leave passes to ensure different off-duty times, and places in some towns are designated white only or black only. The United Kingdom is hardly a racial paradise, but the British public thinks that black and white have both come over to help win the war. Many shopkeepers and pub owners object to being told who they can and can't serve. There are also stories of bus conductors blocking white Americans from forcing black comrades to give up their seats. Reports record reactions ranging from confusion to disgust at Jim Crow segregation. Some even find black GIs more polite and better behaved than the white ones. One maybe mythical remark recorded by the Ministry of Information goes, I don't mind the Yanks, but I can't say I care much for the white chaps they've brought with them. The British are by no means immune to racial thinking, though. Tolerance for black GIs is based mainly on the understanding that they are temporarily visitors who will remain at a distance. Black troops are never placed in British family homes, and authorities specifically advise against interracial relations. 
harsh punishments sometimes await the girls who don't listen. In January, two female factory workers are sentenced to three months of hard labor after being found sleeping in a hut where black GIs were stationed. While all this cultural exchange has gone on, the build-up has continued. It has taken on particular intensity in the spring. On April 1st, a 10-mile deep visitor ban is introduced on English coast, running from Land's End in the west to the Wash in the east. The port towns in this zone are now hives of military activity. Harbors are packed with the ships to side to side. Rivers are filled with landing crafts and every roadside has parked tanks and trucks. Soldiers are camped on every spare piece of ground there. But it seems all the excitement is going to some people's heads. At least that is what Alexander Clifford thinks in his column for the Daily Mail. The British public is going through a bad case of invasionitis. At times, as reflected in the newspapers, it almost looks like hysteria. I don't mean for a minute that it is a question of jitters, but merely that the people are in the grip of a powerful interest which has been sustained for an unhealthy length of time. The zero hours set by most of the armchair strategists have come and gone. Enthusiasm and excitement come to the boil too soon. All the important things that can be said about the second front have already been said a hundred times over. And now, because interest is so intense, relatively insignificant aspects are being whipped up into an excessive importance. It is, of course, natural and inevitable. Intelligence staff are also getting nervous that the plans might leak out. It doesn't help that the Daily Telegraph keeps printing invasion code words in its crosswords. On May 2nd, one of the answers is Utah. Then on the 22nd, it is Omaha. Then on the 27th, there's Overlord. The 30th, Mulberry. And finally, on June 1st, it's Neptune. By this point, MI5 decides to bring the crossword writer in and interrogate him. Clearly, this is a method of passing intelligence to the enemy. But the conclusion is that it's all a coincidence and they let the writer go. He's a teacher at a school near a military base. Turns out he often asks his pupils for crossword suggestions. They give words they have heard when hanging around with the soldiers. Thanks to Operation Fortitude, Neptune's secret is safe, as Astrid, my mom, has also been showing you today. But though the plans remain secure, it is clear that the Americans are on the move. In May, roads become clogged with military traffic as men, trucks and tanks make their way down to the gathering camps and then the embarkation points. For many Brits, this is the last they'll see of the Yanks. As one woman will recall, I got off my bike and waved for a while. Now I'm older, I should probably cry with the realization. But then I just accepted they, they had not come to sit the whole war out. I had never failed to see an American in town each time I went to school or work. Now it seemed peculiarly empty. Next to the men and their leaders, these Brits are some of the first to know that something big is happening. The last sign comes the evening of June 5th, when aircraft fill the sky and shake the ground beneath their feet. The people of Portsmouth look on as the world's greatest armada passes them by. The last question is where all these men, boats and planes are going. That is answered just after 9.30 the next day, today, with a BBC news bulletin. Early this morning, units of the Allied armies began landing on the coast of France. But the fighting on the ground in Normandy is far from over. At Gold, the fighting for Le Hamel has continued all day since the troops first hit Gold Beach this morning. But this hot spot finally falls to the first Hamps at 5 p.m. They bring in the only surviving Churchill AVRE from the 82nd Assault Squadron, this one armed with a 290mm petard mortar that fires 40-pounder shots. This drives up to the rear of WN-37, right? And it sends one through the back door and it just demolishes the interior. 
Major Warren, remember him? Yeah, well, Major Warren and his C Company and five tanks of the Sherwood Rangers mop up as that Churchill blows down the rest of the sanatorium complex. Behind Omaha, fighting also continues. Clarence Hubner, commander of U.S. First Division, departs from USS Ancon and heads for Easy Red Beach. Here, he takes command from Willard Wyman, his assistant. Near the mouth of the Saint Laurent Draw, he establishes his headquarters and immediately links the 116th Infantry with the divisional artillery. Just about half an hour earlier, Charles Gerhardt did the same, setting up the new beach headquarters of his 29th Division. James Roberts, Giraud's aide, lands this hour too to set up 5th Corps headquarters north of Saint Laurent. Giraud is to arrive around 9 p.m. Together now, these guys can finally give 5th Corps command some reliable information about what is actually going on on and near Omaha Beach. So far, communications between the assault troops and command has been a massive failure. A lot of this is because of the many naval fire control parties who were killed on the beach during the attack. And after that, it's been difficult to establish a new line of communications in all the chaos of battle. This lack of timely intelligence about the actual locations and the progress of the men has led to a general lack of support from the warships offshore. There's barely been contact between the fighting men on the beaches and the naval spotters, whose job it is to maintain radio contact and direct the shell fire. Many spotters have just relied instead on shipboard visual observation when choosing targets for the bombardment. And this has led to inaccurate shelling and friendly fire. And even now, those naval spotters know nothing of what is going on beyond the bluffs and only see the high church steeples of Virville, Saint Laurent, and Colville. At about 5.30 at Omaha, the first non-American unit of the day is landed here. This is 180 British men of the Royal Air Force's 15082 GCI radar unit, ground control interception. They're supposed to set up all their stuff between Virville and Le Moulin, and the plan is that they'll work with a fighter direction tender offshore. They don't land where they're supposed to though because of the current and the lack of clear paths through obstacles, touching down east of D3 and coming under fire. They very much do not expect this and they lose a lot of their radar gear and will soon enough lose 26 out of 34 vehicles. They also will have the problem of being fired on by American troops because of their blue uniforms, which aren't all that different from the German field gray. It's funny how historiography pigeonholes the fighting and the need for simplification leads to misconceptions because Omaha is really not just a beach, it's the whole area behind it. That goes for all the beaches, of course. The same goes for San Maraglis. We looked at that together with Paul when we were in Normandy. So we are in Normandy on the Cotentin Peninsula with Paul Woodach. And right behind us here is a wonderful diorama showing how the 82nd Airborne came down here right behind us. Now it looks very different actually from the, because of all the, obviously you have all the water and stuff. Paul, can you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing? Yeah. So we're facing west. Cherbourg is about 20 miles uh, behind me. Utah Beach is nine miles ahead of us. And this is the Murder Ray River which today is about 10 foot wide. Yeah, but back in 1944, we're talking about the water starting just at the bottom of the slope there, going right over just before the chapel there, because this, this is the extended flooded area caused by the Germans playing around with the French uh, coastal defense system by closing all the lock gates. So from autumn 1943, right the way up to the spring of 44, water just cannot drain away in, into the sea. So you get this massive area of inundation uh, causing a huge problem for, for both sides, in fact, as the battle unfolded. And uh, oh, then this would be the point that you'd have to seize in order to effectively block or cross, depending yeah. on who you are. The, the problem with the floodings is the floodings has been, have been put there by the Germans to deter the Allies from landing here at all. But yeah. we've needed to come here because we need Cherbourg, the deep water harbour. The problem that the flooding has caused is for a point between north and south of 27 miles through the floods, there are only two 
viable crossing points. One is this bridge here at Lafayette, and the other is another bridge about half a mile down the river at Chef du Pont. So all of Seventh Corps under Lawton Collins landing on Utah Beach is fighting their way inland towards these two incredibly tiny but incredibly important crossing points of the floods to push on to the other side of the Cotentin to trap the Germans all up in Cherbourg. So that little bridge that looks like it can't be in any way significant at all at the time was one of the major objectives of 7th Corps to just force their way across the peninsula. So where, where did the landings actually take place? So we're in the middle of a triangle of drop zones. For the, the three drop zones for the 82nd, one is up there ahead of us and two are over there, so around the flooded area, with the idea of, of seizing this causeway, and that's how I'm going to refer to this road now because with the floods either side, that's what it becomes. So seizing it from that end, seizing it from this end, and at the same time holding the vital crossroads of Santa Maria Glees, which is a mile and a half back up that way, which is the big central communications point in the Cotentin route, uh, roads going to the Cherbourg, back towards Caen, and across the peninsula from what became Utah Beach to the other side of the peninsula. So you said Santa Maria Glees, which is really an important point here because to us standing here and to anybody seeing this this looks like the countryside but this yeah. is really part of the San Marigolese battle this is possibly even the most extensive part of it why well it's become the Santa Marigolese battle has become focused on the tragic sideshow of what happened within Santa Maria Glees itself, where a couple of uh, sticks of paratroopers who had a navigation issue flew over San Maria Glees and dropped these paratroopers right over the city centre where there happened to be some Germans out there in the town square. There was a fire in town that was just completely one of those random things. And these paratroopers died in the, in the square there. And that has become the focal point for so many people's understanding of what happened here on June the 6th. But actually, it's a, it's a tragic sideshow. The job of the 82nd is to form a kind of protective cushion around this crossroads to provide this area that the Seventh Corps from the beach can then move into with all these transport nodes, all these choke points, the bridges then seized to facilitate that push across the peninsula. So, yeah, another statement that keeps on being made all the time is that the 82nd and the 101st were dropped, I mean, I hear that all over the place, were dropped in because their mission was to hook up with the infantry that had landed on the beaches. That is exactly what I was going, <laughs> <laughs> going to say, right? Why is that wrong? Because the opposite, the, 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 the Seventh Corps from the beach are moving towards, the, towards where the paratroopers are. They're, they're, the paratroopers are not doing the moving. The beach forces right. who have the, the vehicles and the transport are moving towards the paratroopers. In the end, some of them did make their way towards the beach because of the missed drops, which is something else we're going to talk about in sure. a minute. But uh, no, the, the paratroopers are forming the, the carpet. Uh, we're going to kind of market garden analogies now, but they're okay. providing the carpet for then the, uh, the, the troops on the beach to move through towards to then reinforce right. and push on beyond that. I mean, that's interesting because, I mean, now we're talking about something that you've covered a lot on the Eastern Front as well and, and something that you covered in, in World War One and the Great War. And that is the change of how we're moving away from a static war towards a mobile war. And, and how does St. Mary Glees specifically fit into that? strategy, take a crossroad and, and hold it. Why is it really essential, if I put it that way? Yeah, well, it's because it's to to bring this mechanized army that's going to be landing on Utah Beach and allow it to spread out and move through this complicated area to navigate through, which is these small lanes and tiny little hedgerow lanes and things. You, you, need, you need some kind of focal point to then control, to then direct things out. And Sam Wrigley's being a crossroads town is that ability and it's just inland from Utah Beach to kind of then finger your way out like a spider's web and move across that peninsula. So it's vital to sort of have somewhere within sight of Utah Beach, because Santa Maria Glees is maybe five miles from the beach. So it's, it's, a, it's an achievable objective on that first day. And then from there, you've got options. And options are, are, are great, particularly with the fact that we're not certain, although there are planned drop zones, exactly who will be landing on where and what conditions will be happening and who, what the reaction will be to the, from the Germans to those drop zones. So having somewhere to focus on is, I think, a very good part of the plan. And how many focal points like that were there that were totally essential? Well, there's Samariglis, and then there are the four causeways through the floods that come off Utah Beach that go through the floods and rise up to the 30 meter high ridge of high ground that is about a mile and a half, two miles inland from Utah Beach because these arteries coming off the beach, if they are not held at the high ground end, 
that means the invasion force is trapped on the beachhead because they can't move through these single roads. Imagine a single road with all your armor and everything coming up it and Germans sitting over there ahead of you on the high ground. That's, right. they're, they're, that's a nightmare, that's a canalization. So holding these little villages at the top of these causeways is essential. That's the 101st job, they're closer to the, the beach. Then the 82nd are seizing the bridges over the river and also the, the high ground beyond. Hill 30 is over there, uh, Chef du Pont, Picoville are over there. These other potential areas where the Germans are then moving up towards the beachhead, so to protect that whole western flank of the invasion. And that was complicated because they landed all over the place, right? Well, they did and they didn't. I mean, it's one of the things that really annoys me and it's kind of the myth-busting thing I like to do is... This is my favorite part when he does this kind of stuff. We're talking... Thank you very much. We're talking like <laughs> 13,500 coming, paratroopers landing that morning, and we talk often about those that landed a long way away from their objectives. And yes, there are some cases of people landing 15 miles away from their drop zone, which is dramatic and not ideal. But by not talking about the men who did land close to their drop zone, we're not getting across that, that uh, basic point that a lot of the men were where they're supposed to be. Drop zone O up there just ahead of us, which is where the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment landing, they had already worked in Italy, North Africa, they have worked with the troop carrier uh, units. So the pathfinders were in place on the drop zone, lighting the beacons, the Eureka sets brought them in, and you're talking about most men landing correctly on the drop zone. Okay. And even with the drop zones over there, N and T, yeah, 20 or 30% aren't on the drop zone, but 70% are probably within a mile or two of where they're supposed to land. Now, when you're talking about the 82nd or the 101st, let's talk the 101st, the 506, the famous unit that provided Band of Brothers. Those guys have been running Kurahi Mountain, you know, three miles up, three miles day, down every day before breakfast for, for, for months. For so a mile, isn't it? <laughs> for, for them to just move their way a couple of miles to their drop zone, it's a, it's a piece of cake for them. The difficulty is navigation. That's one of the things I want to make it clear, that when they're coming down here that morning, you are in the middle of nowhere. There is no light here whatsoever. Yeah. So you've got, a, you've got a compass, you've got a map, and but a, a, a compass is totally useless until you've worked out where you are. So you find out which way north is, but then where am I in relation to these other things on the map? So it's about finding that identifying feature. So we can see there, there's a church just over there, but in the middle of the night, is that visible? And with the high hedges and the trees around here, finding that first position, that first marker would take a bit of time. But the point is the paratroopers are beginning to land from not much uh, beyond midnight, the landings on the Utah beach aren't till sort of 6.30 in the morning. So they've got six and a half hours to get themselves sorted out. So even if they spend two hours finding out where they are, in the grand scheme of things, they've got still got several hours to get to their objectives. And that's the thing that despite the misdrop of the paratroops, despite the fact it was never as many people in, in any place as it was supposed to be, they achieved pretty much 95% of all their objectives that morning. Right. So that is the Allied perspective. Most people landed where they were supposed to, some did not, it created a mess. But from the German perspective, what we've got is it's a it's raining men situation, uh, right? Yeah. We've got the darkness and the difficulty of navigating on the Allied side. We got the overwhelming effect of over 30,000 people coming in from the sky and landing more or less on top of the Germans. What did that do? Well, I think had the landings occurred successfully, neatly, 100% in their drop zones, it would have been fantastic from the Allied point of view, but the Germans would have identified where those drop zones are almost oh, immediately, yeah. would have worked out, therefore, where they must be going immediately, and that would have been uh, a different situation. What happens here is, for example, in that set of farm buildings just down there were 22, 23 Germans that morning out on a uh, uh, nighttime patrol, and they're going to be having information coming at them from pretty much every single one of the 360 degrees around them. There's paratroopers over there, there's paratroopers over there, there's some paratroopers over there, there's some paratroopers over there, there's two there, 10 there. Now, do you move out to meet a force of an unknown size, right. or do you tend to stay where you are and try and wait for a clearer picture to emerge? And what happens pretty much universally behind the Utah Beach with the American Airborne, and to some extent, behind the 6th Airborne areas in the east, you know, 70 miles away from here, is the Germans sort of stayed put and waited for someone further up the chain of command to give a clearer picture. And about three miles that way is the Chateau de Berneville, which was the headquarters of the 91st Luftlander 
Air Landing Division, whose commanding officer Wilhelm Falli is on his way back from going to the conference in Rennes, that is a big feature of the longest day film, folks, is he's on his way back there, but on the, on the way back to his chateau to get to his command post, which had telephone exchange and radios, he's, people say ambushed, but ambushed to me implies prepare, some yeah, kind of preparation. Yeah. He bumps into a group of lost paratroopers who kill him uh, in his car. So the 91st Division is now a chicken without a head. They, yeah. they, the commander has told them he's coming back to tell them what to do. He doesn't turn up at the command post. So there's a dif division that has been designed. The, the air landing division has been conceived to be a mobile strike force to respond to an airborne landing. That's what they're trained in. And they have been cut out of the picture because their commanding officer hasn't arrived there. So the the elite response unit, although I wouldn't really use the word elite, but you know what I'm suggesting yeah, yeah, sure. here, is incapacitated. And that is just one of those things as a knock-on effect of the paratroopers not landing in the right place. They are achieving their intended objectives, but they're achieving things that weren't on the list that helped immeasurably to, to secure the, 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 well, a greater area from our point of view, but to lay a huge amount of confusion on the Germans. And that lack of coordinated response by the Germans is, is absolutely vital as to why the 7th Corps progressed as well as they did on June the 6th. One of the overlooked part about this whole situation here <coughs> is how that influenced the total casualties on Utah. And can you talk a little bit about that? Well, yes. I mean, we, when we talk about the comparisons between the beaches, so the British sector, the Canadian sector, American sector, is when we talk about Omaha, we focus on those men that were killed on the beach there, who are part of the 5th Corps, so two divisions, the 1st and the 29th landing there, with an engineer brigade that is all making up that same unit there, and then everybody else who's part of it. 7th Corps on Utah Beach, which is the 4th Division, and then the 90th coming ashore the next day, also includes the 82nd and the 101st. So if you want to make a fair comparison to Omaha and between Omaha and Utah beaches, you have to include the paratrooper losses that are inland from Utah Beach, but it's the same plan, but they don't get included. So when you add all those airborne guys killed on D-Day, and we do not, even 78 years later, have an exact number of how many men in the paratroopers died on June the 6th, because the data wasn't collected for the first day, only for the first 48 hours. So yeah. they're sometimes finding a dead body you know, in a bit of flooded area over there, and they're not sure, did he die on June the 6th, or did he die in an isolated bit of combat on June the 7th, or maybe even June the 8th? So we don't know those casualties, but it's hundreds killed or wounded, uh, paratroopers on that first day. You know, something that struck me when you were, when, this is actually the reverse of mid-May 1940, when you're talking about losing a high officer, leading to stagnation in terms of response, leading to your opponent, managing to you know, make a breakthrough or advance and stuff. That was exactly the reverse we saw, which allowed, allowed a great deal of the, of the German blitzkrieg through France after the death of a French general. And we had that entire episode, the May 25th, 1940 episode, which was actually called the Allied Cluster and I'm sure you bleeped the middle of that. That's the actual name of the episode on our channel. But it's got asterisks because, you know, they can handle people dying, but they can't handle the swear words, yeah, yeah. apparently. <laughs> but, uh, but it was full 48 hours that allowed, allowed Panzers to cross France. Because, well, people were like, well, I, I don't know what to do. Who's, what's going to do? Yeah. And here yeah. it's, it's compounded by two things, of course. We have Rommel, who's gone thinking the invasion isn't going to come. He's gone back to Stuttgart to celebrate his wife's 50th birthday. And uh, we've got... Hitler, who insists on taking all the decision when it comes to the Panzer and not allowing anybody. And now we've got commanders being knocked out. Yeah. You know, there's been a lot made about the confusion. Would you say that this is actually more important than the confusion, the lack of cohesive uh, command because of absences and deaths? I would say so, yeah. I, and I think to add a little bit of weight to that as well is when you talk about the airborne, who are disorganized, is that in many ways, they know that, they're, they're prepared for that. If you ask an, an, uh, an infantry division veteran, what unit were you with? He'll invariably say, I was with the 29th, I was with the 4th, I was with the, if they're British, I was with the 3rd Division. If you ask a paratrooper, who were you with? He'll, he'll give his regiment, or maybe even his battalion, as his, I was in 3rd Battalion 506th. Right. He may even say his company, because that's how they see. They see themselves as part of a small unit. 
So this idea of 18 or 19 men as a stick jumping out of an aircraft and only five or six of them actually being together on the ground and fighting, they're kind of prepared for that. That's what they've been told to do. It doesn't, you don't need to be part of a mass organized unit, especially given what they're doing here. These paratroopers just got on with stuff. It's like, is there a farm on that crossroads? Yeah, there is. I don't know where I am, but why don't I just occupy that farm and stop anything moving up that road in front of that farm? Uh, is there a telephone wire there? Yes. Shall I cut it down so that, that inhibits German communication. Yes, I'll do that. Is there a German over there? I'll kill him because he doesn't kill me. In fact, Don Baguette, A Company 506, great friend of mine, wrote Kurahi a Screaming Eagle in Normandy. He just figured, is the guy wearing gray? Yes, I'll kill him. Uh, it's going to help with the war. It's very basic. You know, you would say to him, what was the plan of the regiment on Didis? I don't care about that. They sure they had objectives, of course, whereas I was just there to kill the guys wearing gray. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, we've just seen in our... Uh, main episode here for D-Day, how San Mariglis becomes the first point to fall during the day to the Allies, that is at least an urban area, we have Pegasus Bridge before that, but this is really the first point that a village falls to the Allied side. But did it really fall? No, not really. A flag was raised over Santa Maria Glees, the very same stars and stripes that uh, had been raised over Naples uh, some months earlier, was raised over the flag at the town, I think at 6.30 in the morning, seven o'clock, something like that. But the town was still under fire. It was, the Germans were hitting it with mortars. There was attempted attempts to move in. I mean, that's what the Germans are doing here. The Germans, as the day progressed, are assembling an independent uh, armoured units over there to push their way towards us here. In fact, it's shown on the uh, relief here, we can move it and show that footage in a second, of the tanks coming across here to get across that bridge. Because we're talking about it from the point of view of the Americans needing to go west to cut off the Cotentin. The Germans are seeing that bridge in a very different way. They're seeing it as the way to get to Santa Mary Glees to retake that network of roads and to push their way back towards the beach and throw the Allies back in the sea. So. This is one of the areas where Santa Maria Glees is being defended, along with Nervillo Plan, another very important action just north of town, where a half Choctaw, half Scottish lieutenant in D Company 505th called Turner Bashir's Turnbull III from Oklahoma, wow. with 30 guys. He's meant to have like a whole company there, and there's Marders and Stugs and all this crap coming down the road towards him from the north, independent units, and he's holding this line across this road there with. Hawkins mines on bits of string run out there and you know you name it everything but the kitchen sink is there and for an entire day he holds Santa Mary Glees uh, from the north there and then eventually when he's out of ammo he leads the survivors back uh, to Santa Mary Glees where they kind of regroup under Colonel Vandervoort and, and, and Krauss and the others that evening. So the Battle of Santa Mary Glees goes all through June the 6th and really keeps on going until sometime like about early afternoon the 7th when finally they hear the rumble of half tracks and, and Sherman tanks arrive from Utah Beach. So it's a flag has been raised, but liberated. If you were a French civilian living in San Mar yeah. Mary Glees that day, you didn't feel very liberated. When you went out to get your baguette from the boulangerie, it felt more like a war zone. And, and you'd been working all night putting out a Putting out fire. fire. Yeah, 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 yeah that exactly. That had nothing yeah. to do with the war. But yeah, so I mean, but it's interesting because this story breaks during the day as well. I mean, it breaks very early on in the news. Worldwide news, San Mar Glees has been taken. I mean, and that kind of, shows us the dichotomy between what the world is seeing yeah, from yeah, this yeah. conflict yeah. and what's actually going on on the ground. And I think a lot of soldiers were quite upset about that as well. We talked about that before at mm. Omaha Beach. Oh, I think definitely. I think that, that paratroopers were told, you've seized this, this, and this. And they're kind of saying, well, it didn't feel very seized at the time. I mean, and it was, it was disorganized at the low level, and you know, I'm talking about this from a his historian's historiography point of view of 78 years of looking at it and understanding how the pieces of the jigsaw put together. I mean, for example, up on the near exit one off Utah Beach, which is where Maxwell Taylor, commanding officer of the 101st, landed near there. And he, it ends up, just because of the way the jumps have gone, there's um, Kinnard is there, Ewell is there, Taylor is there. So these are senior officers and like about three privates. And the quote is, never was so a few led by so many. <laughs> so they reversed the whole Churchill 1940 thing. So that kind of thing wasn't supposed to happen, but they just got on with it. And, and it, it felt disorganized. It felt like that they weren't maybe achieving what they were supposed to because they weren't necessarily on the, in the town on the map they'd been told to be at. But collectively, they were securing everything they needed to do and more. Um, and, um, and I think that should be 
the focus of our attention, not so much all these guys got missed drop miles away from their drop zone. Another thing I want to address while I've got you here and while I've got you here is this stupid idea of hundreds of guys dying in the floods that I hear repeated again and again and again, okay? Maybe a dozen, maybe two dozen maximum members of the 82nd and 101st drowned that morning because we're talking about water that isn't very deep, right. okay? In most cases, the water is going to be, in, well, in Spartacus's case, up to his shins, in our <laughs> mortal cases, up to our knees. Yeah. So, you know, you'd have to be really unlucky, even with the weight of your reserve parachute and your gear there, to, to drown in water that's, that's a foot deep. What is the problem of the flooding is the lack of heavy equipment getting out of there. Uh, this is the case here at Lafayette of guys kind of wading out of that with a fighting knife between their teeth, and that's all they've got. And in fact, this, this tableau here has the bit by my feet here where it's the, the sculptor has included the rigging lines cut through with his fighting knife because you're landing there, it's the middle of the night. Your sure. parachute is being pulled across that water by the wind that's blowing there. You want to be out of that quickly. So out comes the knife and the paratroopers have a knife up here in the collar of their jumpsuits, at least another one and, and the belt and maybe a bayonet and probably another one in a pocket there. They've got blades everywhere. Okay. Out comes a blade, straight through the rigging lines, off, that's the parachute out the way. But your leg bag, if for example, you've jumped with 50 pounds of gear in a leg bag, that's the first thing you cut away because that's, that's going to uh, uh, make it life difficult for you to get out of that water there. So very, very few paratroopers actually drowned. But landing in the water was an absolute pain in the ass because you're leaving behind the mortar bombs you wish you had later, uh, the, uh, the C2, the Hawkins mines, all that gear there. Uh, and by the way, the, the leg bag was not a bad design. Those who watched Band of Brothers and see your cardboard Liptons and Bill Garnier's cursing this thing. The British have been using the leg bag since North Africa and Italy. It's fine providing you don't cram too much gear in it you, you, and you know what you're doing with it and you have enough altitude to, to pair out the rope and so and so. What's happening on D-Day? is the aircraft are moving faster than was intended because they're taking on the flak. The intended jump speed was meant to be about 105 miles an hour. You bring the C-47 down to almost stalling speed and the slower the speed, the closer on the ground the men in the stick will land beside each other. But if you're taking ground fire, you have a tendency to move a bit faster. And the other thing, that another myth that we're going to bust here is when people say, oh, those damn 9th Air Force troop carrier pilots were flying too fast. They had to fly as fast as they did because every guy in the back, universally pretty much in 82nd and 101st, knows this is the big fight coming. They've done some training jumps, they've done all these training exercises. This is the one. You're gonna be thrown out of an aircraft in the middle of nowhere in French countryside. So they've been squirreling away another couple of grenades in their footlocker and another pack of ammunition for your Thompson. So these guys are boarding the aircraft with 120, 130 pounds of gear, not the 60, 70 they would have had in training. So 20 guys in aircraft, each with 40 or 50 pounds more in gear, and that yeah. was what was happening that morning, added so much overall weight to the aircraft. When the pilot hits, and you can see this again when we bring the camera in on this here, you can see the aircraft coming in <coughs> from the rear of the Cotentan to avoid coming over the channel, avoid coming over the fleet, they come in from the back there, is when the pilots hit that coast there and eased off the speed to gradually get towards the drop zones and get down to 105 miles an hour, they can't, it's so overloaded, the, the aircraft would fall out of the sky like a stone. So the only way you can avoid crashing is push back on that stick, up, you know, rev up the engines, try and regain that altitude you've lost when you've been plummeting. So a lot of guys are jumping out of an aircraft going 160, 170 miles an hour that morning, and they're lower because they've lost altitude trying to slow down. So, you know, you're counting your 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 check, and I know paratroopers just said they, they think their feet hit the ground as they said 3,000. Wow. So you've, you've had a few seconds in the air. And that's when the leg bags didn't work because right. you just haven't had time to go and they get broken off. And the, shock, the, 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 the jump shock, the rope just snapped. Yeah. So the, there's nothing on the leg bags. It was just the, the, the way they were used on D-Day wasn't good. You pointed to it right now. I mean, this is really, truly a wonderful memorial. It, it, it's very illustrative of what, what went on here. Could you walk us through a little bit what we're, what we're looking at here? So this nice bit here shows the whole Koten Tampa Peninsula, showing Cherbourg at the top, 7th Corps landing on the east coast there to move their way across the west, across the flooded area here, 
to, 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 to trap the Germans up there, then the whole Seventh Corps can squeeze their way up. The Germans can't escape, the Germans can't reinforce. And you know, the intention was to get across the Pinsa here in like two days, it ended up taking a couple of weeks. Then this central part of the, pla uh, of the memorial here shows the causeway with the floods either side. These are explosions in the water here. And these are German tanks. Anyone who understands, they're actually French tanks. The first one was a Panzer III, there was a couple of Renaults and Hotchkisses. And they're coming across there and there's an American here with a bazooka by the core of the bridge, valiantly defending this approach to San Maraglis, which is, as I said earlier, the whole point of this is keeping that crossroads in San Maraglis secure by a cushion of paratroopers around it. And these guys, these Germans who've got here, have already had to get past the 508th on Hill 30. They've had to get past the 507th over there. So each movement of Germans is already losing some of their number by a few paratroopers there, a few paratroopers there. So it's like, by the time they get here, they're already reduced in size and no, no armed German gets across this bridge during those first three days invasion. This, wow. this approach to San Maragos is held secure. James Gavin, the assistant divisional commander, was here for most of that time. Major Kellum, uh, one of the commanding, commanding officers he, uh, of, the, of the battalion, he was here. And these guys hold this area here. Here is where the paratroopers are earning their jump pay. This is where they've come here to hold this job. This is protecting Utah Beach, which is in turn protecting the entire western flank of the June the 6th invasion. So I would make a very strong case that one of the most important battles on June the 6th is the, the, the one here on the afternoon of June the 6th at about 3 p.m. when they halted these German tanks coming towards us. Okay. There's a lot more going on. When we return for the 19th hour of D-Day, we'll have a closer look at deception, intelligence, and espionage. Can't wait. But before we do that, we will take a deep dive into the explosive devices the infantry is using today. One of the most steadfast tools of the modern infantryman is the hand grenade. The concentrated power of TNT from a man's fist trumps rifles and bayonets for clearing trenches and dugouts. Effective as both an offensive and a defensive weapon, grenades can be thrown over distances without the operator exposing himself. Usually filled with TNT or its equivalents, the exploding grenade can kill, wound, or simply disorient whole groups of men with burning chemicals, deadly blast pressure, and fragments of razor-sharp metal pieces. On the American side, the main explosive item is the Mark II Rifle and Fragmentation Grenade, introduced back in 1918 and standardized in 1920. It's called the Pineapple because the grenade's body is made out of metal segments in six rows of five, who look similar to a pineapple. Once the safety cotter pin is removed, the fuse primer is ignited and the wielder has four to five seconds to hurl the grenade towards the intended target. Containing two ounces, 57 grams, of TNT, the Mark II can be thrown around 30 meters or travel 140 meters if fired from a rifle. Like the British Mills grenade, the ignited charge then causes the grenade's body to shatter and the splintered fragments fly in all directions to cause maximum damage. This is especially effective in clearing out dugouts and bunkers here on Normandy's coastline. Of course, there is always the danger that the enemy will answer with a hail of grenades of their own. Every German point of resistance has several wooden boxes of grenades stored away, ready to be used by the defenders. The traditional German Stiel Handgranate has retained its iconic look, which gave it the nickname the Potato Masher. Evolving from the trench clearer of the Great War, the Stick Grenade 43 is the Wehrmacht's universal infantry weapon on the battlefields of this day of days. It's basically a hollow wooden handle combined with a thin sheet metal head that contains a bursting charge of 165 grams of Donarit explosive. Both the friction igniter and detonator assembly are screwed onto the head of the grenade and connected with a double length cord to a porcelain bead at the lower end of the handle. To arm the grenade, the soldier unscrews the metal cap at its end, pulls the porcelain bead and throws it. The friction igniter then detonates the charge after four to five seconds of delay. To take out enemy strong points or vehicles, several steel hand granate can be formed into a bundle, the Gabalte Ladung. German hand grenade doctrines 
usually favor the explosive power of TNT over the fragmentation power of allied grenades. For example, the Steel Handgranate 24 holds about twice the amount of TNT as the oval British Mills grenade, which gives it a lethal blast radius of around three meters. There are, of course, many different grenades, each varying in shape, size, and intended purpose. One of the most interesting is the Gammon grenade in the British arsenal. This has been specially developed to give paratroopers an explosive charge strong enough to use against armored vehicles. The Gammon grenade is basically just a lump of plastic explosive stuffed in a stockinette bag, as John Keegan describes it. But its major selling point is its sticky exterior that adheres to armor plates. Filled with up to 900 grams of plastic explosive, the Gammon is strong enough to disable most German fighting vehicles one way or another. But even without specialized grenades, there are more ways than one to use something wrong enough until it goes boom, right? American airborne units are equipped with phosphorus grenades to produce smoke. But if phosphorus burns hot enough to produce smoke, then it burns hot enough to cause dangerous wounds to flesh as well. Paratrooper Frank Brumbaugh states, we were ordered not to shoot unless it was totally in self-defense. Since I couldn't make any noise, I tossed a white phosphorus grenade down at their feet through the hedgerow. It makes a small pop when it goes off. Very little noise. It will devastate anything in the area and it can't be put out. So it's best for the Germans to keep the allies outside of grenade throwing range. General Feldmarschall Erwin Rommel has long thought the fighting during the invasion would resemble a great war type battlefield. The space between the waterline and, and the hinterland would become a new no man's land and the same tactics would apply to fight over it. Barbed wire and metal obstacles were all well and good, but what would really pay off would be landmines. By October 1943, German engineers had already laid more than two million anti-tank and anti-personnel mines all over the coastline. Rommel then doubled, then tripled that amount. In May 1944, there were over six and a half million mines on the coastlines. The Wehrmacht's engineers are trained to handle a whole arsenal of different mines, booby traps, IEDs, and field exploders. The most common anti-personnel mine is the S mine. These are laid in between other obstacles, often in three rows from high to low water marks. The cylindrical S mine is activated by applying direct pressure on the igniter in the head or by pulling a trip wire attached to it. Seven kilos of pressure is enough to set it off. Then a propellant inside the base of the cylinder projects the main mine into the air. Simultaneously, the powder at the bottom of the detonator tubes is ignited and the inner cylinder detonates, causing 360 pieces of scrap, steel balls, and rods to be flung around. There are other variants of the anti-personnel mines. The Schutzen Mine 42 is a cheaper alternative. Made out of impregnated plywood and hardened cardboard, the Shu 42 weighs only half a kilo, but 200 grams of that is TNT. Another is the Glass Mine 43. It takes nine kilos of pressure to break the hardened glass pressure plate and trigger the chemical igniter. Like the wooden mines, the glass mine is much harder to detect by allied mine clearing teams. There are also all kinds of fake trigger mechanisms and nasty anti-lifting igniters just to be as much of a pain for allied engineers as possible. For killing tanks and other vehicles, the Germans deploy the larger Teller Mine 43. This cylindric mine has a large mushroom head pressure plate screwed into its igniter socket. Since a strong spring must be overcome to depress the pressure plate, the teller mine is not set off by the weight of regular infantrymen. The minimum pressure is 230 kilos. Once that happens, then the hexagonal cap descends and pushes the striker into the main body of the igniter and sets off five kilos of TNT. A single teller mine is usually enough to wreck a wheel and axle assembly and cause heavy damage to the chassis of unarmored vehicles like trucks. For anti-tank traps, the Germans often place double teller mines. A single teller mine 
will most likely break the track of a Sherman or other American tank, but not necessarily damage the bogey or the suspension. A double teller mine, though, will ensure that both track and bogey wheel are totally wrecked, and if lucky, will even break the axle shaft. But breaking tanks with mines today is not just a German concern. Although a mine is traditionally the defender's weapon of choice, they can also be handy for offensive ambushes, especially by paratroopers. The British developed the Hawkins anti-tank mine in 1942, a derivation of their sticky bomb. The main selling point of the Hawkins is its versatility. It can quickly be turned from a mine to a controlled demolition charge to a throwable grenade. Once stepped on, the weight of the enemy deforms the surface of the Hawkins and ignites its 450 grams of TNT. In the remote control version, it's simply equipped with a demolition cord and triggered by an electrical impulse. But mines are not the only tools to seal off the battlefield. Barbed wire at the beach exits and seawalls could prevent Allied troops from breaking out of the killing zones, but cutting through it with shears is both time-consuming and dangerous. So another more effective more immediate solution is needed. The Bangalore was invented by the British Army in India all the way back in 1912. It was basically a piece of cylindrical tube made out of metal and filled with high explosives that could then be fitted to other similar cylinders until you have a long line of explosive tubes. Each part was one and a half meters long and carried nearly four kilos of TNT, enough to cause a blast radius of three meters. The Bangalore was then simply shoved into the belt of barbed wire and triggered by an electric detonator. Although the US is often skeptical of British wartime inventions, they readily deploy the Bangalore today to blast their way through the beach defenses. One major question for both sides when it comes to D-Day is the role of armor during the invasion. Is Allied aerial supremacy enough to make short work of the approaching German panzers before they get to the beaches? Will Allied Shermans and Cromwells find a watery grave at the bottom of the channel? Well, if the answer to either of those is no, then small arms will not be enough to stop the advancing machines protected by centimeters of armor. Anti-tank mines and grenades are great, but the infantry needs extra tank-killing capabilities in the field. The American problem solver is the bazooka. The M1A1 anti-tank rocket launcher is a shoulder-fired breech-loading weapon developed in mid-1942. The 135 centimeter long tube weighs only six kilos and can be operated by a gunner and a loader. The weapon, fired by an electric impulse coming from two batteries in the grip, has a maximum range of around 270 meters. But although the M6 heat rockets can penetrate seven and a half centimeters of armor quite reliably, the gunner has to get uncomfortably close to the enemy to be effective. If they survive long enough though, an experienced bazooka team can fire four rounds a minute, which is generally enough to stop German armor dead in its tracks, literally. The bazooka is also very effective in demolishing German strongpoints. Sandbags and stone walls offer little protection against the explosive force of a well-placed rocket-propelled grenade. While I'm on the topic of blasting through defenses in France, I should point out that German anti-tank capabilities have always been somewhat lackluster. In France, and then especially the Soviet Union, they encountered heavy armor that seemed impossible to penetrate with anything but their heaviest caliber. A solution came with the introduction of the hollow charge, with which German engineers have been cracking fortifications ever since the beginning of the war. The hollow charge basically channels the explosive force towards a single point of penetration. Putting two and two together and getting four, they came up with an idea to simply shoulder fire such an armor-piercing shaped charge against enemy tanks. The Panzerfaust is the first of a series of different designs called the Faustpatronen, and these Faustpatronen are dangerous weapons indeed. But not just for the guys on the receiving end. Even without a grenade attached, the propellant charge is permanently set inside the discharger tube. 
Once triggered, the propellant's gases shoot out from both ends of the tube, releasing spurts of chemical flames. And these spurts are strong enough to tear off limbs or rip open stomachs. There have been many deadly accidents and an Allied directive after today forbids any Allied soldiers from using one without prior training. The Panzerfaust is pretty effective, although limited in its usefulness. On the plus side, since it does not have to compensate for recoil, the shooter can fire it from any position as long as the rear of the tube has enough room to release the gases safely. On the minus side, its effective range is under 100 meters. After encountering bazookas in the field, the Germans began further experimenting and eventually developed the Panzerschreck, the terror of tanks. It works on the same principle as the bazooka or the British Piat, firing rocket-propelled grenades through a metal tube. The Panzerfaust 60 can fire a projectile filled with 1.3 kilograms of explosives at a speed of 45 meters per second. Something innovative is the metal shield at the site that gives the operator at least some protection from the dangerous propellants. But like the American and British equivalents, the short range and cumbersome reload does not make it a very attractive weapon. If the gunner manages to hit a tank, then he better kill it, because once fired, the Panzerschreck's smoke trail betrays its position immediately. The Panzerschreck man said, it's a Sherman, we can finish him. And before I could answer, he fired. The explosion wasn't large, but I saw many fragments of metal burst off the hull immediately and the track stopped moving. I heard crackling noises, which sounded as if it was burning. This was an incredible success for us to have hit two tanks with two shots. And I remember feeling a sensation of great pride in this achievement. But the second tank fired on us with high explosives. The Panzerschreck man was hit by shrapnel in the shoulder and neck and began bleeding heavily. He threw away his weapon and took a grenade from his boot, handing it to me. He told me we should blow ourselves up rather than be captured. He was either very fanatical or mentally unbalanced. Of course, we saw a successful Piat attack near the beginning of this series by Benouville Bridge. To combat German fortifications, the Allies deployed more than just grenades. From the beaches, American specialists carried the M2 flamethrower into battle to deliver deadly spurts of flames into bunkers and dugouts. But carrying two bottles of a gasoline oil mixture and a third bottle of nitrogen on your back is an uninviting job proposition. Not only do they weigh over 30 kilos total, but the tanks are also easily punctured and sometimes even ignited by enemy action. The operator needs room to use his weapon as well and naturally has to go in first and expose himself. But once the flamethrower is put into action, the enemy has reason to panic. The M2 can engulf a target in flames at a distance of around 20 meters for seven seconds straight. Just the appearance of flamethrowers in the vicinity is often enough to make the defenders throw down their weapons and surrender as no one wants to be cooked alive. At that point, there was almost a mutiny and some men started pulling the bolts out of their rifles. Just then, the man in the observation hat shouted, my God, they're bringing up a flamethrower. We heard the woof of the flamethrower, but the flames couldn't get through the staggered sections of the ventilation shaft although it turned red hot before our eyes. Now there was near panic. And last, but not least, and not just because I like talking about it, enter the Goliath, a remote-controlled, cross-country, self-destructing mini-tank. The thinking behind this futuristic design is to combine the capabilities of a tracked vehicle with the destructive power of a remotely activated explosive charge. The Goliath 303 is supposed to be a battlefield assassin. With its low silhouette, this mini tank is to lie low in small dugouts among the dunes until it's activated. A three core cable around 600 meters long connects the machine with the operator's control panel. Powered by either an electric motor or a gasoline engine, it can reach a speed of around nine to 10 kilometers per hour at least on level ground. Carrying up to 100 kilos of explosive, the Goliath makes his way stealthily to the target, and once in position, the operator just hits the switch from a safe distance. The firing circuit is closed, the dry cell battery in the Goliath activated, and the machine self-destructs in the name of the fatherland. 
pretty cool idea, but the results have been disappointing, at least from a historian's point of view. Allied bombardment has either wrecked the Goliaths or their control stations, and those that have survived are plagued by their design issues. They are much too heavy, and they get stuck on even minor obstacles in the field. <laughs>